All right, so here we go. Um, if you look at the first page, the probability of an event is what we're concentrating on. And typically, it's favorable over total. Favorable uh, just means what do we want to occur. So sometimes they'll say, what's the probability of an event not occurring? So sometimes your favorable is a not. So view it that way. Uh, finding the probability of an event. Two coins are tossed. What is the probability that both land heads up? Well, we need to know um, how many uh, total possibilities there are. And really, you can look at it two different ways. We'll have our total possibility. Whether you throw the coins up together as you know, one toss or separately, will it make a difference on your coin toss? No. I mean, how you toss a coin, yes, can make a difference on how, whether you know, it has your tails come up. But if you flip a coin properly you know, by flipping it rather than throwing it up or you know, however, it will make a difference. So we've got our first coin versus our second coin. And typically, we multiply those possibilities together. How many possibilities could occur on the first coin? Two. And so same thing on the second coin, heads and tails. So we end up with four total outcomes. So that's what we did in 9-6. For this particular one, you could do a pundit square. This side would represent heads and tails on one coin, and this side would represent heads and tails on another coin. Or you could do a tree diagram. So I could have heads, heads, or heads, tails, or I could have tails, heads, or tails, tails. There's our four outcomes. Tails, heads, and heads, tails are considered different outcomes. So in a different order. Um, the question says, what is the probability that both land heads up? Well, we only have one outcome where both are heads. That's our favorable. So our probability of heads, heads, typically you'll write probability this way. Probability of heads, heads equals one out of four. So there's our actual answer. Now, you could have done it differently, and you could have said, well, what's the probability of heads on the first coin? What's the probability? I mean, how many favorable outcomes are there out of heads, tails on the first coin? One out of two total possibilities times how many possibilities are there for heads on the second coin? One out of two total possibilities. Doesn't that also give you one fourth? A variety of different ways we could have approached it. Now this is a more simple view because I'm not tossing 10 points, right? Tossing 10 points, you now all of a sudden have a lot more issues um, or problems. All right, so let's look at part B. A card is drawn from a standard deck of playing cards. How many cards are in a standard deck of playing cards? 52. And remember, if you don't know, on the back of your 9-6 notes, you should have listed out all the parts of a standard deck of cards. What is the probability that it is an 8? So how many cards are you drawing? One. So there's only one event. It doesn't matter whether we replace or not replace because there's not a second event that follows it. So, and we only want an ace. Did it specifically say an ace of spades? No. So how many aces are in a deck of cards? So the probability, on a different color, the probability of an ace is 4 out of 52. <coughs> you have to reduce that, and you should get in the habit that, okay, four, there's four suits, and each suit there are 13 cards in the suit. That means 4 goes into 52 13 times. So there's a 1 in 13 chance. I would prefer you leave the answer as a fraction rather than a decimal or a percent. The fraction is the more accurate one. And then um, part C. Caitlin, would you mind closing my door since 
it appears that some classes are a little loud today. We're a little fuzzy. There we go. Now we are throwing two six-sided dice. What is the probability that the total of the two dice is seven? They don't want to know what are all the different um, outcomes, but here's the deal. Anytime I'm throwing dice and they're asking me questions about sums on the dice, if I were you, I would list out the following six by six chart. Why did I choose a six by six? There's six sides on each die. So just like we did with a Punnett square with the coin, we're gonna do the same thing. Pardon? We're gonna do the same thing with our dice. So on one die, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six possibilities. On the second die, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Now the, the issue is not our total number of possibilities because on our first die, on the first die, we have six possibilities, correct? Times the number of possibilities on the second die, we also know is six, and wouldn't we multiply those together? Oh, you can't see it. Well, we'll have to go to fuzz. So the number of possibilities on the second die is six, and if you multiply those together, you should have 36 total possibilities. That goes in our denominator, but we need to know specifically what's the probability that the total of the two dice is seven, so the sum is seven. Well, you can sit there and think of the sums of seven, but you might miss some. So if I were you, I would be going, okay, I have a one, one, a one, two, a one, three, one, four, and so forth. So keep filling it out. And then you can use it later on some other problems if need be. The great thing about this chart is you will start to see a pattern with the sums. And there's a reason why craps is an interesting game in Las Vegas because if you look at the sums of two dice thrown, which is the number of dice you typically throw in craps, they have some interesting odds for uh, 11 and 7. So, if you look at the, what's the lowest sum that you can have when throwing two dice? Two dice. Two. What's the highest sum? 12. So, if I said to you, what's the probability of a sum of 13, your answer would be what? Zero. So, you could be asked that question. If I were you, I would start putting a diagonal here, here, Notice that these two are all sums of what? Three. And those are two different sums, just like on the uh, heads, tails, and tails, heads with a coin. And then I would, playing havoc with my eyes, there we go. Those are all sums of four. These are all sums of five. And then six. And then seven, and then eight, nine, ten, eleven. Now you could have done it the other way too. 
But if you look at your diagonal, here's all your sums of 7. 7 has the most sums available, so it is the highest probability sum when rolling two dice, a pair of dice. How many possibilities are there? Six. So my probability of a sum of 7 is equal to 6 favorable out of 36 total, which reduces to 1 and 6. Now all of that should be reviewed, correct? Thank you. Let's look at D. So in a state lottery, which we have here, a player chooses six different numbers from 1 to 40. What is the probability of winning the top prize? How many numbers in the lottery, when it occurs, would be favorable for winning the lottery? Is there one correct set of numbers, two correct set of numbers, three correct set of numbers, and don't complicate matters? There's only one correct set of numbers. Don't let the Powerball and all that kind of stuff in our state lottery get you there. Or that if you get four numbers right, you get the, I'm talking about top prize. The top prize, there's only one set of correct numbers, isn't there? But there is a uh, lots of different possible combinations. So if I've got 40 numbers to choose from, 1 through 40 is 40 numbers, and I'm choosing six at a time, does the order of those numbers matter when I choose my numbers? If you've not played the lottery, you may not know the answer to this. But does the order matter? Like if I chose 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and instead of it, I chose 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, would that be a different set of numbers according to the lottery? No, not according to the lottery. So in this case, order doesn't matter. So if you haven't played the lottery, you may not have realized that. So note to self, when playing the lottery, order doesn't matter. So write yourself a note, order doesn't matter. So what you practiced in 9-6 is coming to play here in, in finding your denominator for your probability. So is this a combination or a permutation? Combination. So total outcomes equals a combination. I have 40 total items and I'm taking six at a time. So it is uh, 40 factorial over 40 minus 6 factorial 6 factorial. So we end up with 40 factorial over uh, 34 factorial 6 factorial. So to shorten it up, you could either do, um, remember the shortcut is to do 6 factorials of 40 or you could instead write 40 out to 34 factorial, which is going to accomplish the same thing. So you have 40, 39, 38, 37, and you can stop at 36 factorial over, I'm sorry, I didn't want 36, did I? How about times 35, 34 factorial, that's where I needed to stop. 34 factorial is on the bottom. See why I didn't want to stop there? And then I've got 6 factorial, so 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Because that's the largest factorial in the denominator, so that tells me what I want to stop at for the numerator so I don't, I don't have to write too much. So it doesn't matter. You don't always stop at this one. Whichever one of these two is bigger, it requires less writing on my part. But I'm still writing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, wasn't I? So whether you take the shortcut of this, meaning just write the first six of this over six factorial, or the only thing I'm adding in here is this extra piece there. And then everything in the denominator should cancel. So I'm going to cancel the six into the 36, the five into the 35, seven times, the four into the 40, 10 times, the three, into the 39, 13 times, and then the 2 into the 
Oh, I'll cancel into the six three times. But you can cancel into whatever you want. So I'm left with 10, 13, 38, 37, 3, and 7. Did I miss any? The who? I canceled the 2 with the 6. So the 2 canceled the 6 three times. But whatever you cancel, multiply together, and we should end up with the same answer. So I've got 10 times 13 times 38, 37, 3, and 7. Did I miss something? Maybe I wrote it down wrong. Oh, I surely did. 10, try it again. So you should have gotten 3,838,380. That's our total. Now, Note to sell, there is only one winning ticket. So the probability of a win equals one in three million eight hundred thirty eight thousand three hundred and eighty. Is that a high probability? No. That's why rich people tend not to play the lottery because they know that they're losing money now. However, just recently, uh, a couple won the lottery, the big lottery, and then they played the lottery two more times in that same week or in within the two weeks after, and they won two more times. They won three times in a matter of one or two weeks. The probability of that occurring is nil. So this is um, 2.61 times 10 to the negative 7. That is uh, not even 1% chance of winning. It's, it's a very, very less than 1% chance of winning. Yes. Well, it depends. I mean, the lottery can be, you know, up to 300 million. It just depends on if, if nobody's won, they just keep rolling it over to the next week. Well, because, yeah, you, you could lose your $3 million. Yeah. Now, does that raise your probabilities? Absolutely, which we'll look at here in a minute. It would, yeah. So, but yeah, you're, you're still risking money. It's and the like, risk is not a good uh, investment. It's just like right. Very few rich people actually play the lottery. Well, number one, why would they have to? Because they're already rich. <laughs> All right, so let's look at um, union of two events. So if A and B are events in the same sample space, the probability of A or B occurring is, and here's the key phrase here, A or B. So um, this is typically what it looks like, the probability of these two things occurring. And um, this is called mutually exclusive. Sometimes the events can occur at the same time and sometimes they can't. So for instance, can you have an ace, let's say if we were looking for the probability of an ace or a spade. Can you have an ace that is also a spade? Yes, so that means that these can occur at the same time. So notice that what you, oh, you can't see all of that either. So notice that we are going to take the probability of, in this case, an ace. We will add to that the probability of pulling out a spade. This is assuming that I'm just pulling one card, just one card, one event. And then we're going to subtract the probability that both could occur together. So the probability of an ace would be 4 out of 52. And I would leave it unreduced. You'll see why as we do it. 
you would add to that the probability of a spade, which would be what? 13 out of 52. And you're going to subtract from that the probability that both can occur at the same time. How many aces are also a spade? One. So you would subtract one out of 52. Because the question says an ace or a spade, not an ace and a spade. If the, it was a probability of an ace and a spade, wouldn't it only be one out of 52? Okay, so there's a difference using that word or versus and. Whereas here, if I ask you the probability of an ace or a five, can those occur at the same time? So these do not occur at the same time. So those are mutually exclusive. They don't occur at the same time. These are inclusive. They can occur at the same time. So notice that in this case, you would take the probability of just your ace, which again is 4 out of 52, and add to that the probability of your 5. How many 5s are there in a deck of cards? Also 4 out of 52. And to add those together, we would not have to remove anything because they don't have to occur, they can't occur at the same time. So look at this one. What is the probability of getting a 5 or a 6 when you throw a die? It should be a die. Because we're only throwing one. So the probability of a 5 or a 6, can they occur at the same time? So they cannot occur So if they can't occur at the same time, we are not going to subtract anything. So we're going to take the probability of a 5. How many 5s are there on a die? 1 out of how many total? 6. And add to that, the probability of a 6 isn't at the same probability. So we get 2 6. The reason why you don't want to reduce is because most likely these denominators will be the same and you want to keep like denominators. Your final answer must be reduced, however, so it's a 1 in 3 chance of getting a 5 or a 6. And you could also think about it this way. How many 5s and 6s are on a dot? 2 out of 6, right? So you could have thought about it that way as well. All right, so then look at example 3. What is the probability of drawing a heart or a face card? out of a deck of 52 cards. I shouldn't have had to tell you it was a deck of 52. So the probability of a heart or a face card. Can they occur at the same time? Can a heart also be a face card? So these can occur at the same time. So this is going to require subtraction. So what's the probability of a heart? 13 out of 52, plus, you always add the probabilities together, what's the probability of a face card? How many face cards are there? There are three in every suit. How many suits are there? Four. Three times four is 12 out of 52. Yes? Say that again? Okay. We're going to subtract out the ones that are double counted which is the whole reason why we subtract out when they occur together. Does that make sense? So how many cards are both a heart and a face card? <coughs> There's only three. Be careful with that. There's only three, right? There's a jack, a queen, and a king. So we're going to subtract out the three hearts that are also face cards because we want one or the other, not both. So I end up with 13 plus 12 is 25. 25 minus 3 is 22 out of 52, does that reduce? What goes into both? Two. So I get 11 out of 26. So last page. Questions on that so far? Okay. We only had one class yet today. We shouldn't be tired. We had plenty of time to sleep in today even, right? Did you sleep in today? Okay, good. He <laughs> still looks almost as sleepy, but not quite. All right, so the probability of independent events. If A and B are independent events, meaning one does not affect the other, the probability that A and B will occur is, now notice we're using the word A, or and, probability of something and something. We multiply, and use 
the word and, we now multiply. We don't add. Or we add. And we multiply. So for instance, you might have this. A computer selects three integers from 1 through 20 at random. What is the probability that all three numbers will be less than or equal to 5? Whoops. Bless you. So we're, we're selecting three integers at random, and we want to know how many of those when we pull them out. So we're just going to grab three. We're not looking at how many combinations there are. We're just looking at if I grab, or the computer essentially is doing the same thing, just grab three numbers out of a box, and the box only has numbers from 1 to 20. This is no different than if I roll a die, but it were a 20-sided die. Okay. I want to know the probability that the number selected will be less than or equal to 5. Does that include 5? Yes. So how many numbers are favorable out of 20? Less than or equal to 5. There are 5 of them, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 out of 20 total. So wouldn't that give me a 1 in 4 probability? Or, so I have a chance for selecting, and that's just one selection, right? You can, you can look at, well, you could look at it this way. I could grab, if I did a, does order matter? Like, let's say that I pulled a 3, and then a 4, and then a 1. And then I put them all back in, and then I grabbed a 1, a 3, or a 1, a 4, and then a 3. Would that be the same set of numbers? Probably, yes. This is just the probability of selecting one number out of 20. Because remember, when we roll the die, we want to know what's the probability of... Um, selecting a 4 on a die. It was 1 4 out of 6. But when we wanted to know what's the probability of selecting a 5 or a 6, we did 1 out of 6 times 1 out of 6, didn't we? Well, how many or uh, how many 5s and 6s was on? Oh, I guess we could do 1 or a 5. It didn't matter. So that was two possibilities out of Six and that gave us a one and a three, didn't it? Okay. When the computer chooses the three numbers, can you repeat numbers? Could you do like a one, one, one? It doesn't say, and so you might want to write here as a note if you have another problem like this. For this particular problem, you're going to assume numbers don't repeat. So here's the actual true probability. So this is really your first step in this. Your second step is, OK, bless you. Just choosing a number that's less than or equal to 5 has a probability of 1 4. But I want to know the probability that all three, bless you, that all three are less than or equal to 5. That's a different probability. This is just a probability of one number being less than or equal to five. So for my first number, my second number, and my third number, those are considered different events. So this is your first number, your second, and your third. So my probability that the first number is less than or equal to five is one in four. Same thing with my second number, and same thing with my third number. They all have a one in four chance of being selected. They're all being selected together rather than one right after the other. So we don't have to worry about uh, replacement versus non-replacement. You're just grabbing them. And each of those numbers that's in that box has the same probability for the ones that are less than or equal to five of being selected. So that's why you don't see me doing um, five out of 20 and then four out of 19 and then three out of eight, 
18. Does that make sense? Because I'm grabbing them all at once, because that's how the computer selecting them. It's not selecting one, and then the second one, and then the third one. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay, because if they change the story and set it that way, we wouldn't have a different probability up here. But that's not how they read the problem. So I've got one times one times one is one. And what's four times four times four? 64. So my overall probability that all three are going to be less than or equal to five is one in 64. And so you might want to write yourself a note that that's the probability of just one number or each of the five, bless you, each of the five numbers that are less than or equal to five has a one in four chance of being selected when you grab those three all at once. All right, so probably the complements. Let A be an event and let A prime be its complement. If the probability of A is P of A, then the probability of the complement is one minus the probability of A. Well, what all does that mean? Well, let's just say that if I said the probability that it's going to rain today is 30%, what is the probability that it's not going to rain? 70%, because all probabilities are based upon 100%. We typically deal with fractions when we're doing our probabilities here. So um, our fraction should be less than 1 because we're looking at it as less than 100% of the items. So that's where we're taking 1 instead of 100 and subtracting the probability that we don't want to get the probability that we do want. You have one in your uh, homework that's similar to this, and this is a, a little confusing to figure out. So I'll try to walk you through it. A manufacturer has determined that a certain machine averages one faulty unit for every 1,000 that it produces. So what's the probability that uh, a unit is good? Well, what's the probability that a unit is bad out of 1,000? One out of 1,000. So what's the prob probability that a unit would be good? 999 out of 1,000, right? What is the probability that an order of 200 units will have one or more faulty units. So it's like, okay, so I don't have a thousand, I only have 200. So step one, you're going to find the probability that any given unit is perfect. And we just did that, right? The probability that any given unit is perfect. It's easier to think of perfect than non-perfect. So the probability that any given unit is perfect would be, as we just said, 999 out of 1,000. So remember with the example above that if the probability of one of the numbers being chosen is one out of four. Then we took, and we were choosing three numbers, we just multiplied that to itself. Wasn't that one fourth raised to the third power? Yes or no? Yes. So what I'm doing is saying, okay, I've got 200 products that I'm looking at, and I wanna know what's the probability that each product that I pull out of that 200, so I have a big box of 200 products, and I pull a product out and I check it, the probability that that unit is perfect is 999 out of 1,000, okay? So the second step is, every time I check a unit, don't I take its probability and multiply it to the probability that the next unit is also perfect? Aren't each of the probabilities that the unit is perfect for each of those 200 being 999 out of 1,000? Wouldn't I multiply 999 out of 1,000 by itself 200 times? Yes, because you have 200 events. Each unit is an event. So as I'm checking a unit, I'm taking the probability that that unit is perfect, and I'm multiplying it to the probability that the next unit is perfect, to the probability that the next unit is perfect. Okay, so it's a high probability that the unit is perfect. So your second step is the probability that all 200 units are perfect. Because it's easier to find the ones that are perfect than the ones that are not. So 
I'm finding the probability that all 200 units are perfect. So what I'm going to do is take that 999 for one unit, and I'm going to raise it to the 200. Where did I get the 200 from? Because I have 200 units. If I had 500 units, I'd raise it to the 500. So write yourself the following note so that you remember why we just did what we did. Each unit has a 999 out of 1,000 chance, you don't have to write chance, to be perfect. There are 200 events. Each unit that you're checking represents an event. So, you can try to put that in your calculator. It, it may or may not give you a proper answer because it might be too huge of a number, but let's just see, just for chuckle's sake, what that looks like. So I'm gonna take in parentheses, 999 divided by 1,000 and raise it to the 200. See, gave me a nice answer. It's essentially 82%. 82% of my 200 are perfect. Okay, we'll deal with that in a minute because I want an actual percent. So then your third part, what I really want to know though is um, what's the probability that I have one or more faulty units? So therefore, because we just found the perfect ones, therefore the probability that at least one unit is faulty is. So we're going to take the probability of a prime. That's the complement of what we just found. You can write the probability that one unit is faulty inside of the parentheses if you want to, but a prime is a whole lot less to write. So I'm going to take is equal to one minus, and I'm going to put in the 999 over 1,000 raised to the 200 that we just found equals. And I'm going to put that in my calculator exactly as is. One minus parentheses, nine 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 divided by one thousand, and parentheses raised to two hundred. I am expecting it to give me an answer that's about what? Eighteen <laughs> percent. Well, it rounds to point two, but we only, we want to round to two places, right? And did it indeed? Yes. Yeah, so if I were you, I would round to two decimal places, and we are not going to do a fraction for this one. I'd be surprised if it gave me a fraction. Let's see if it does. Nope, I figured it would <laughs> it would protest. So it's 0 0.18, and I am rounding correctly. Well, for your notes, let's go ahead and put out to 4. Or our brain would uh, view it easier as 18%. So basically, this particular company has an 18% fail rate, which is actually, if you consider which type of product you're talking about, let's consider it's a pacemaker going in your father's chest. Do you think an 18% fail rate for something that requires major surgery to go into your puppy's chest is a good failure rate? No. Wouldn't you want something that is super, super, super less than 1% failure rate? Okay, so now, however, if it's a, oh, if it's a chicken nugget, would the failure rate of a chicken nugget at 18% be all that big of a deal? No. Probably I'm expecting the chicken nugget at McDonald's would be a higher failure rate than that because they're nasty. 
Well, I guess that's, leads that, that's the interpretation, right? 